again to the seminar today, so I would like to know, are there any announcements on before we introduce our speaker? Right. Okay, so probably he needs no introduction, but uh, I'm happy to introduce Christian Vogler, who he's a uh, professor in our school. Um, and I've actually known Chris for quite a long time. After he graduated from college, he was accepted into our master's program. And before he started that uh, program, he came and he worked for a summer. And I think that's where he first got interested in round tie. Um, he then went on and got a master's degree and a PhD with uh, uh, Dr. Sergio Sinudo. Will help me, and he was still working on uh, uh, brown tide issues. Uh, he liked Long Island so much that he didn't leave, and he accepted a um, an academic position at what was known as um, LIU, the Long Island University Southampton campus. And when they were holding, and Stony Brook became interested, uh, Chris came and joined our faculty. Uh, serving as uh, the director for academic programs for our school uh, at the Southampton campus. Um, since then, many great things have uh, happened to Chris. Uh, in 2014, he became our associate dean uh, for research. In 2015, very um, important uh, role, he was named co-director of the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology. Uh, he's received several awards, including a um, Environmental Champion Award by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and in 2017, he was named uh, the inaugural uh, endowed chair of coastal uh, ecology and conservation at Stony Brook. Uh, he has well over 150 peer-reviewed publications, uh, some fairly broad research interests, um, of which one of them is coastal acidification we'll hear about today. I do know something about Chris that the, uh, our older people know about him, the younger people may not. He's also a very talented musician. He plays the drums. We used to have a lot of talks about who had the best drummers in rock and roll. <laughs> and, um, and, and and I just found out that his group, Thomas, which I thought it folded because they've all gotten married and they have children and jobs now. He said, no, they're still playing. <laughs> and he used to play for Oktoberfest. So grad students, get, get Thomas to play <laughs> uh, next October. He will bring the band and they'll play. And they'll get the band back together. Yeah, but I'm not sure we can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> We usually pay, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, with that, very good. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I think for filming purposes, am I supposed to turn down the house light? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's great to be here. Um, our dean asked me to give this talk, and, and actually Josie happily accepted, because I guess many people are at Ocean Sciences this week. So uh, <laughs> next week. Well, I guess Josie was happy for me. She had this open anyway, so good. So some of the Ocean Sciences people are here. Okay, so I'm um, going to talk about ocean acidification. Uh, I'll first off just acknowledge this is all a team effort. Um, this is a recent lab photo, but through the years, obviously, it's the uh, graduate students who are doing all the work, and I'm just taking the credit for all their hard work. Uh, so, you know, this is what we look like now, and I'll acknowledge some past grad students as we get through uh, the talk as well. Uh, as a general outline, I'm going to go over just an introduction to ocean acidification, talk about its co-occurrence in coastal ecosystems with low oxygen conditions, um, and specifically talk about those effects on marine life. And if time permits, I have some information on acidification and macroalgae, um, but I have way too many slides, so we'll see what happens. Okay, um, this is the Keeling Curve, and I love to put this up. I think it's great for, uh, it's a generational slide because everybody can look at the year you were born or so, maybe your year's not up there, but uh, that's why I say or so, and, uh, <laughs> and think about 
you know, what CO2 levels were like either at the start of the curve or where when you came onto this planet and see where we are today. And, um, you know, just recently passed the 400 parts per million mark and there's no turning back. That is to say, even last year when we hit our annual minimum on this planet, that minimum was still above 400. And uh, this year, and if you can't see, this is the data from uh, earlier this week. And uh, the maximum, the annual maximum won't occur for never, uh, another several months. So uh, we'll probably wind up at the end of the, uh, this seasonal maximum probably of above 410. Um, and as a side note, this is always a challenge for experimental work. When I started doing ocean acidification work, my control condition was 380. And so we keep having to buy new tanks of gas to match what the actual conditions are. It's hard to keep up. Uh, and this is the figure I always like to first point out for ocean acidification. Uh, if you look in the literature and put those two words together and do a search at Web of Science or Google Scholar, those two words are hard to find together before 2003. So this is one of the first papers to really call this out as a specific issue uh, and specifically to point out that since the Industrial Revolution, the pH of the ocean has already decreased. Uh, they estimated how many gigatons of uh, carbon we had to combust uh, as fossil fuels. And actually, I'm sure this is a gross underestimate because of some things that have happened since 2003 with regards to the discovery of fossil fuels, the way we can obtain them now. Uh, and then estimated the levels of CO2, what they'd be like uh, in the atmosphere and how that would translate into a change in pH of more than 0.7 units in the surface ocean. Uh, and I'm sure we're mostly aware of the chemistry, but the idea is that CO2 reacts in water to make a hydrogen ion. That's the H and pH. It's a negative log scale. Uh, so that's our pH going down and the acidification. And that hydrogen ion binds onto or wants to seek out a carbonate ion uh, to make a very stable bicarbonate uh, compound. And therefore, as the CO2 levels in the ocean go up, the carbonate levels go down. Uh, and of course, that right off the bat, when people realize the ocean pH is decreasing, carbonate levels are going down, the first consideration, or the first concern, was with regards to the animals that would be making shells out of calcium carbonate. Uh, and because even some of the preliminary research showed that small changes could have a big effect. Uh, and just uh, as a general point for fisheries here in New York State, most of the top fisheries, at least in this particular year, but I think even historically, aren't fish. But they're actually calcifying bivalves. So this goes beyond just being, this brings it therefore into an issue uh, not just of uh, the environment, but obviously affecting, uh, potentially, seriously protect, uh, affecting fisheries. Okay, so now I'll go back to Darcy's little time machine. Bring up this photo here, a little fuzzy. Uh, it says undated. So firstly note, this is Vax to Flax, right? And so that's back in the good old days. So undated, it's actually 1994. Um, and uh, I will tell you, I'm up there, so you can guess where I am if you haven't found me already. Uh, this was back in the good old days when we actually did run either from the Flax Pond Laboratory to Stony Brook and back uh, no, not end back, one way, one way. So this, this is the start. Uh, and in fact, we, it was only a few years ago we transitioned to staying on campus for safety reasons, which I uh, fully understand. Uh, longer, really tough run. This was, for people who have done it, this is a tough run because you're going from sea level up to more than, I don't know what it is here, 200 feet? But anyway, uh, and so this is great. There's some great, for people who are around at that time, Michael Ahrens, anybody remember Michael Ahrens? He was the gazelle who would win this race flat out. Uh, I've won this race, I guess, in the recent past. I used to get creamed as a grad student because we had Michael Ahrens, who was a total gazelle, and then Mark Green here, uh, who was also a great you know, marathon runner. So I'm just going to point out a few people here. Uh, point out Bob Aller, if you didn't notice him already, in his short shorts. Uh, he's not here, so I could say that. And then point out Mark Green. Oh, and there I am, by the way, if you hadn't seen me. There, uh, there, there I am, back there. Oh, oh and I want, needed to point out, if you can't tell, those of you who didn't know, see that off the back there? That is a ponytail, incidentally. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, long hair uh, for several years of graduate school. Um, but anyway, I'm mainly pointing this out. I'll come back to Bob Auer later, but I want to talk about Mark Green for a moment. Um, he was my housemate for about four or five years in graduate school here at SOMAS. Uh, when he was due, we both did our master's and PhD here. He finished a little bit before me. Uh, but was a really big influence on me. You know, obviously, as a housemate, I was aware of his science. And of course, we were really good friends thereafter, so we kept up thereafter. And so this first paper 
of his looked at dissolution of carbonate shell bearing organisms in Long Island Sound. He was advised by, by Bob and Josie. Uh, and then when he went to St. Joseph's College in Maine, where he still is, he kept looking at this, but specifically started looking at bivalve. So I remember talking to him, and you know he was thinking just about acidic muds and that, how that might affect bivalves. But at the same time, I was thinking a lot about ocean acidification. And we talk about how it may be affecting bivalves. Uh, and so you look at the time course. This is in, in 98, before people were even talking about ocean acidification. 2004, when people are. Uh, and then I just had to put the last one, maybe one of the better titles of, of, uh, of science, Death by Dissolution. <laughs> Uh, and it's this, this uh, last paper there. Um, and so Mark was working with juvenile stage bivalves. And also at about the same time, uh, I had some other projects where I was looking at harmful algae and actually larval stages of bivalves and recognized how sensitive they were uh, to harmful algae and other environmental conditions. Uh, and so with the ability, and so these are videos of uh, larvae. If this thing is working, this is a clan that's actually spawning. Looks like a little moved out before. But uh, you know, larv the, the first several weeks of bivalves uh, that spend on w after their, um, uh, they become fertilized uh, embryos, they spend their first several weeks as larvae uh, in, in the water column. Uh, and further, when they're first spawned, these are cells that are just purely organic material, no mineral coating. And therefore, as it turns out, the energetics of having to go from sort of an, an embryo to in the first few days putting on a mineral coat or a mineral shell, specifically calcium carbonate, is energetically extremely demanding. Uh, and so turns out that this was an important life stage to start looking at. So this is uh, work from my, some of the first work that I did on ocean acidification with my graduate student Stephanie Talmadge, where we were looking at these larval stages of both base scallops and hard clams and simply looking at an array of CO2 levels. Um, and you can see the effects, right? Higher CO2 levels specifically leading to lower levels of survival. One of the important things here, so firstly, here's our ambient level. We're already at 390. Uh, and then this is projections for maybe end of century and then next century. We also had a level of 250 parts per million, which would be considered pre-industrial. And so one of the interesting things out of this talk was the uh, this uh, paper was the fact of the matter that even going from pre-industrial levels of CO2 to modern day, that's a challenge that increases the um, mortality rate of larval stage bivalves. And I'll, uh, I probably won't have a chance to come back to that later, but there's more evidence assigning to it. So that is, the acidification that's already occurred is not inconsequential for these certain stages of calcifying organisms. Beyond the mortality, uh, Stephanie was able to get some really striking images on the uh, scanning electron microscope in the engineering department. So this is the, about, you can see, 36 days old. These are clams. Uh, and we're going from low to high CO2. So obviously, they're another consequence, they're smaller. She did a cross-section of these individuals to find that their shells got thinner and thinner, and they began to look more and more frail and fragile. Uh, she looked specifically at the hinge of these uh, clams to see that the hinge was well formed under low levels of CO2, but began to decay uh, and be very poorly formed under high levels. And then looking at the outer shell, she saw that uh, it looked, you know, you had normal ridges or so under the lower levels of CO2, but at the higher levels, you had these pock marks and large crevices that began to form. Uh, and then beyond the hard clams, she also did this with scallops. Uh, and then an interesting side note, in 2014, I ended up getting a call, uh, literally, from the White House staff. They were putting together a report uh, that they, was published in 2014, The Challenge of Ocean Acidification, and they loved these images. Uh, and so they specifically asked for these images to be incorporated into that report, which obviously I was happy to oblige. I had to modify them slightly. Uh, and then that thereafter led to twice when I went to Washington, D.C., to give briefings, uh, congressional briefings to the um, staffers and congressmen for the House and Senate, uh, both in 2014 with NOAA, and then again in 2015 for the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and maybe all coming from the, those particular images, hard to say. Um, but just to end up on Stephanie's work, just looking at the effects of CO2, I already showed you that it re re resulted in re reduced sizes, thickness, integrity of shell, and shell morphology. Her work also showed that the acidification in the larvae would lead to 
lower rates, uh, lower levels of DNA, lower calcification rates, slowed metamorphosis, and reduced lipid content. And you know, you look at the literature; all those things would tell you that the reductions in survival that we saw in the larvae uh, may be only a fraction of the total mortality experience because once they get on from the larval stage with this sort of uh, compromised physiology, the survival rates are likely to be even lower. Okay, so to stick with graduate students. So uh, this was two years ago, last year. When was Hawaii? I think Hawaii was last year, Aslo. Uh, and so here are graduate students working hard. Two of my current graduate students, uh, Andrew Griffith, actually he just finished, and Ryan Wallace. Note the, uh, if you can see there, the incredible sunburn. So not only are they goofing off, but they have been goofing off for quite some time. <laughs> but actually they've been doing some really good work. And so I want to, just while we stick just in the acidification of things, just want to highlight some work that Andrew Griffith recently finished where he wanted to understand not just the ef direct effects on the larvae and the, uh, how they might survive thereafter, but actually how the next generation uh, of adults exposed to acidification may fare following adult exposure to acidification. Uh, so these would, to look at things like uh, non-genetic inheritance, so things like nutritional pr provisioning perhaps of eggs and perhaps some epigenetics. Uh, and of course, this is one of the, the uh, key questions to the challenge of ocean acidification. Will marine life or how will marine life adapt, right? And so one would be genetic adaptation. Some people worry that the change, rate of change is so great that that might be a challenge. Uh, but if there were these non-genetic inheritances, inheritances uh, that might not be an issue. And so he set up some experiments. This was recently published in scientific reports uh, where he exposed adults through, during gametogenesis, so as they were conditioning to make their gametes for the next generation, exposed them to normal and high levels of CO2, and then took the next generation. So after the adults were exposed to acidification, examined how their offspring would fare under a host of conditions. So a full factorial cross uh, where all of the offspring were exposed, uh, well, all the offspring from all the cohorts were exposed to both high and CO, low CO2 levels as well. And then just to make things even more interesting, he exposed them to additional stress of a harmful algal bloom or thermal stress as well. And so, to talk about what he found. So this, these are hard clams, this is survival of the larvae. And again, the conditions, ambient to ambient, ambient to elevated. So these are the adults who had normal CO2 and these were the adults that had high CO2. Uh, and so, just in survival, the bottom line is one, there was no adaptation that we could observe. And that is, regardless of how the adults were exposed, their offspring both did equally poorly, uh, which is what we've seen before. So no signs of transgenerational adaptation. Uh, in addition, when it came to the uh, rates of metamorphosis, uh, we saw, as we've seen before, a decline uh, when exposed to high CO2, but an even greater decline from the parents who had been exposed to high CO2. So this was, again, the, the thought was that transgenerational exposure could lead to some kind of adaptation. This is actually the reverse, whereby the offspring are actually doing worse than you would have predicted, not better. Uh, and that was further manifested, well, and then here, based on size, again, no signs of transgenerational adaptation. Uh, but this idea that when the parents are under stress during gametogenesis, that their offspring might do poorly, was further evidenced uh, when he started doing some of these other experiments, for example, here looking at thermal stress. So three temperatures, the highest of which we know would be the most stressful. Uh, and you can see when the parents are ex uh, had been exposed to regular levels of CO2, ambient levels, the, uh, there's no difference in the ex exposure to high CO2 for their larvae. However, when the parents were under stress, you can see that the larvae did worse and worse, particularly if the larvae were then also exposed to high CO2. And then finally, a similar trend, exposing the larvae to a harmful alga. Uh, we saw that under high CO2 and the harmful algae, the uh, survival rates decreased. And if their parents had been exposed to high CO2, their performance was really bad. And particularly if they were getting high CO2 as well. So you see this stepwise reduction. Uh, and so the idea that exposure to acidification during gametogenesis might benefit the next generation uh, did not play out in this particular set of experiments. And in fact, to the converse, it, what, did, what was evident 
is that the stress of being exposed to acidification during gametogenesis made the next generation actually more vulnerable to ocean acidification. Uh, and then just a, a, one other thing to talk about when, before I move into estuarine uh, coastal acidification is our fish populations uh, and some work that I had done with Hannes Bauman when he was here and Stephanie uh, with some embryonic larval stages of silver size, specifically Minidia barilina, showing that higher levels of CO2 also, uh, when exposed during the um, embryonic stages, resulted in reductions in survival. Uh, each of the different colors is a different experiment. Uh, and of course, these are important forage fish, an important energetic link uh, that is bringing prime productivity to higher trophic levels, but also being able to, to um, uh, well, bring prime productivity to higher trophic levels. And then with regards to recreational fish, uh, work by Chris Chambers at the NOAA lab in New Jersey has shown similar results. So that is, if exposed to high CO2 during the embryonic stages, uh, the surviving, the, the numbers that survive to hatch are quite low. This is specifically for uh, summer flounder. Okay, so that's just sort of my introduction to ocean acidification. And when I started working on ocean acidification, it was really thinking about it in this context here. And if you look at the time scale here, you know, over the centuries, the ocean will progressively acidify and will eventually get to these high levels of CO2, 2,000 parts per million. Um, but there's a recognition, of course, that when you get into the coastal zone and you're not talking about the open ocean, things are quite different. And there's a lot of other important biogeochemical processes happening that are also going to be influencing the extent of acidification in coastal zones. Uh, and in fact, happening today. And so, for example, uh, almost 10 years ago, Dick Feely in Science published this paper showing that waters being upwelled off the West Coast uh, bring up high CO2 water into the uh, shelf region, and that that has biological implications as well. Uh, work by George Walbusser, I think gave a seminar here not too long ago, uh, demonstrated, and others, uh, demonstrated that as that water comes up, it depresses the saturation state of aragonite, which depresses the survival of oyster larvae. So this is stuff that's happening today. Uh, and then similarly, uh, up in Maine, where um, uh, actually Mark Green is a co-author on this particular paper. This is um, Mook Sea Farms, one of the biggest uh, oyster farms uh, on the east coast of the US. Uh, and there, they worry about freshwater input, because the river water coming in is acidic and can lead to a uh, dramatic depression uh, in the saturation state of aragonite uh, around the regions where there's heavy rivering discharge. And then beyond that, we now know that also another process that promotes acidification uh, is eutrophication and the overloading of organic matter. Uh, so this was a collaborative work. There's Bob Aller, who was great in helping put the ideas together for this paper. This was. Uh, led by Ryan Wallace, who was uh, out in Hawaii getting a tan. You saw the earlier picture. Uh, and with the general premise being that we all know, of course, that nutrient loading leads to algal blooms and can lead to low oxygen. But that low oxygen is from microbial respiration. And that concurrently, in addition to taking up oxygen, the CO2 is being uh, produced. Uh, and so when it comes to hypoxia, this is a paper Denise Breitberg just published uh, last month. Uh, we're all aware, of course, that there are hypoxic zones all over the world and that the ocean is deoxygenating. Um, and so this is, these are, any area you see here that's hypoxic, chances are it's experiencing some degree of acidification concurrently. This slide's a little bit blurry, but it's something that we all know. Estuaries are net heterotrophic. So you can see here, this is dozens of estuaries. This is done by Jane. Caffrey from the US EPA looking at net ecosystem metabolism uh, and essentially showing on an annualized basis that of these dozens of estuaries that she looked at, almost all of them were net heterotrophic. That is, consuming oxygen on an annual basis, which concurrently means they're experiencing acidification. And you'll note the very few exceptions, or two of the only three exceptions, have uh, submerged aquatic vegetation seagrass. Uh, and again, so the idea that the degradation of organic carbon brought in by primary producers not only takes up oxygen, but produces CO2, the same CO2 that leads to ocean acidification. 
And so there's Ryan again, because I'm about to show a bunch of his data. Uh, he's hopefully he's finishing his PhD soon. Um, <coughs> see here, I don't think he is. Um, but he's got it, put together an enormous data set and done a spectacular job of bringing in um, monitoring technologies, r remote monitoring technologies, and being able to essentially visualize and understand both the temporal and spatial occurrence of acidification in estuaries. Uh, setting up a data flow system for continuing monitoring, uh, a sled system for undulating monitoring, and then getting probes that monitor CO2 and also pH on a total scale. Uh, and so one of the first places we looked at, of course, if you wanted to look at hypoxia, was Long Island Sound. And so here's one of the first data sets that Ryan generated from that paper that I just showed you. Uh, this is a cruise that was done on the Seawolf uh, from New York City out to Port Jefferson. Uh, it was done in August. And there, and these are obviously vertical section plots. And so uh, here is the hypoxic zone that we know occurs every single summer in Long Island Sound, uh, although it seems to be getting better. Uh, but concurrently, when we measured other aspects of uh, carbonate chemistry, things looked, uh, well, I guess, as we might have predicted. So first, you're looking at pH. You can see that we're at a pH below 7.5. Once you get below 10 meters all across the sound and the western sound, even within the surface waters. PCO2 levels, I want to really emphasize the scale here. So we're looking at here, anything in the red or the orange is above 2,000 parts per million. Right? That exceeds what's predicted for the open ocean uh, in two centuries. And this actually really redefines the way people have to and have been thinking about ocean acidification. There's a group called the PACA, uh, European Program on Ocean Acidification. Uh, they published what they called their best practices manual shortly before this was, uh, came out. And they had a whole chapter in there saying, if you're going to do ocean acidification experiments, never use more than 1,000 parts per million as your high level. Because it's unrealistic. And we'll never see that, at least for more than 100 years. And so obviously, that needs to be reconsider reconsidered in the light of what we know is happening now in coastal zones where we have extended periods of time where there's thousands of parts per million of CO2 today without the forthcoming ocean acidification. Uh, and then further, oh, with the exception of surface waters, much of the water column being undersaturated when it comes to aragonite. Uh, and then looking at this, we purposely obviously went, our first look was when we thought hypoxia would be worse. But when we got some of the Connecticut DEP data and looked at oxygen and pH, uh, this was sort of a typical year. I forget which year this was. But um, what you see is that you know, things look fine in, in the uh, spring. And then again, come sort of back to normal by fall. But this is a seasonal phenomenon. So you can see here dissolved oxygen, the development of uh, hypoxia in the western part of Long Island Sound. I'll emphasize now that in these cruises, this is not just to Port Jefferson. This goes all the way out uh, to uh, Plum Gut. Uh, so the full length of Long Island Sound. So the development of hypoxia in the western part of the sound. But if you look at pH, what you see is that the acidification starts, uh, maybe gets more intense even earlier, and persists longer. And this is something we see time and again. This coastal acidification uh, hangs on much longer than the hypoxia does. Uh, and then we think it's partly because of the fact that oxygen just in or out, whereas the CO2 that comes in has to work through the entire carbonate system. Uh, and then just to further emphasize, we had out in a buoy in Long Island Sound in 2014, we had a pH probe. Uh, we had to redeploy it uh, in late June of this year. But to see, there's the seasonal progression through May uh, into June. You can see the pH going from near normal at 8 and then becoming acidified and then just continuing to drop and spending nearly a month at a pH of 7. And again, if this is 7, we, you, yeah, I always caution students. I say, you know, you can't say acidic. Never say acidic. It's acidification. But this actually is a case where their water is actually acidic. It's actually below 7. Not much, but it's below 7. Uh, and it persists for a long time. And this has important implications when we think about uh, experimental conditions and how we want to expose animals to acidification. Uh, and then concurrently, these are uh, some cruises. I think they were done the same year with a data flow system that Ryan had built on the Pominock, the vessel out in Southampton, where he did, he called these the Adrian Block cruises. Does anyone know who Adrian Block is? It's the first person to actually uh, realize you could, say, you could bring a boat through the East River. Um, anyway, 
So uh, what you see is the same sort of seasonal progression. So the CO2, first you'll note, is always high in the East River. We can talk about that later. But you can see that seasonally it progressively declines. And again, late summer is when it's lowest. And here in surface waters, almost above 1,000 throughout Long Island Sound. Um, and further, we note that every time uh, we hit late summer in Jamaica Bay, that's another area, hot spot for high CO2. Uh, so to look at that more carefully, uh, this is Jamaica Bay. For reference point, here's John F. Kennedy Airport. Uh, and so just cruising through there, through Grassy Bay and out to the inlet, again, you see these enormously high levels of CO2, so above 2,000 parts per million. Uh, and the same area, of course, with low CO2, and you see this very tight correlation between the CO2 and the dissolved oxygen, again, pointing to microbial respiration driving both down the CO2 and driving up, uh, excuse me, driving down the oxygen and driving up the CO2. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Ryan also built this undulating system for a sort of a 3D view of pH. So again, for reference point, this is John F. Kennedy Airport. Here's the Rockaway Inlet that goes to the New York Bight. And so here, you can now get a sense, not just what it looks like on the surface, but how it looks below the surface. So again, things look pretty normal. Uh, again, a, around a pH close to 8 when you, and for at least the water coming in. Uh, but as you move through the estuary, firstly, you'll note the pH levels start dropping. Uh, so now we're making our way towards the north channel. So you can see now we're getting to pHs of 7.6, 7.5. Uh, and then things really start to change when you get to the very back, Grassy Bay. It's the deepest part of uh, Jamaica Bay. But what you see is that, firstly, very interestingly, high pH in the surface associated with productivity, but just go just below that, and you see pH levels getting down below 7.5, below 7.5. Three. Um, so you can see very dynamic both uh, horizontally and vertically. And you also can see in a plot like this, this is a very interesting plot that Ryan put together. Not only is it a correlation, but it shows you three different parameters. So it's showing you the relationship between pH and DO concurrently plotted with chlorophyll fluorescence, which essentially shows that phytoplankton blues will drive up the DO and pH. But absent that, you can see things regress down to a condition of both hypoxia as well as acidification. Uh, and a yet further view of this at John F. Kennedy Airport, uh, we got uh, through Homeland Security to put a uh, automated uh, uh, vertically profiling probe on the JFK pier um, and to generate this view of what things look like seasonally in that same exact area, now with depth as well, end time. So this is starting at about August 15, 2016, so going for about 100 days. Uh, and during that, and vertically down, you can see up to 8 meters. And so what we see over time is the development of a series of algal blooms, right? high chlorophyll. Now this lower plot is the co-occurrence of both DO and pH. So it colorized for pH, and then the numbers are DO, so this plot in here is a hypoxic zone with less than 2 milligrams, 3 milligrams per liter, and pHs of around 7.3 or so. But note that every time you get an algal bloom, that's the sole relief for these surface waters, where they're injecting the oxygen and driving up the pH. OK. Uh, so obviously, photosynthesis is very important for controlling carbonate chemistry and oxygen. Uh, and in shallow waters, unlike Jamaica Bay, where here, note, you know, things are not changing much at all, uh, staying steady there. But when you get into shallower waters, the activity of phytoplankton uh, can have a big day-night effect on the acidification and hypoxia. Uh, and so that's shown here. This is a 20. This is only a 12-hour cruise. So putting a vessel here in Grassy Bay and doing vertical profiles every few hours for oxygen, pH. PCO2 and aragonite. Uh, and what you see is you go from, this is at sunset, and this is about daybreak. And so as you move through the night, you can see that the, firstly, the levels of oxygen <coughs> decline, and currently the pH levels go down, the CO2 levels become enriched, uh, and the system becomes undersaturated. Uh, and this has important implications on, on many levels, recognizing that you know, the answer you get with regards to what conditions are is going to depend on 
when you get your sample. And so if you go out in the middle of the day, the answer you get is going to be very different than if you're out there in the middle of the night. Uh, same sort of situation. This is now in Western Long Island Sound. And, uh, and here's a data set uh, collaboratively with Hannes Bauman at, from Flax Pond. Uh, and looking at the diol fluctuation of pH and DO, and also the tidal cycle. Uh, so, and the gray is at night, white is during the day. And so, the real, the worst conditions, that is the lowest DO and the lowest pH, so a DO below 2, a pH below 7.2 in Flax Pond, uh, occurring not only at daybreak, but also when you, that daybreak lines up with the low tide. Uh, so you get the alignment of tidal conditions where the low tide gives you the strongest signal of the salt marsh uh, whereas conversely, high tide would bring in that Long Island Sound water and would counteract uh, the strong respiration within that ecosystem. And then finally, another one of these colorful plots from Ryan Wallace. Here's a 24-hour period from a site in the Peconic Estuary dominated by macroalgae. Uh, and again, it's showing pH colorized for dissolved oxygen. And so, wild swim, and this is, I think, a, a, a couple of months of monitoring during the summer. But note the wild swings in what we're looking at here. So for example, oxygen that is almost anoxic many times at night and getting up to nearly 20 milligrams per liter by day. Uh, and conversely, you can see how the pH is fluctuating from almost acidic to uh, well above 8 during the day. So very strong day-night cycles in many different types of locations in estuaries. Um, all right. so. I think I'm going to just keep moving now, skip over that summary, and just talk about, so what does this mean, the low DO and the low pH? So uh, my first introduction was just about acidification, but we now had to realize or recognize that that acidification is not happening all by itself, uh, and that oftentimes in estuaries, it's concurrent with low levels of oxygen. And so now I need to go back and talk about Bob Allard again, uh, since he's not here. And and talk about Mark Green a little bit. And always notice that whenever they worked on anoxic sediments and anoxic muds, they'd be working in a glove bag. And I talk to, you know, like any graduate student do, you talk to your, your fellow graduate students, say, hey, what's going on in there? And, you know, and, and then talk to Bob in years since. And the idea that they wanna, obviously when they're dealing with anoxic muds, they wanna recreate the conditions under which the muds were uh, collected. And the fact that they, and to do that, they're gonna be bubbling in nitrogen gas, but They'd also often use carbon dioxide because they want to make sure that the conditions are reflective of what the actual uh, is going on in the environment. And so this got me thinking because in reading the literature about hypoxia and starting to think about hypoxia, I recognized that for almost 50 years, scientists had been doing experiments with regards looking at the effects of hypoxia in marine life and bubbling with nitrogen gas but not thinking about the carbon dioxide. And so when you do that, and you just put nitrogen gas in, it does a spectacular job of evacuating the oxygen, but it also evacuates the CO2. Uh, and it drives up the pH. And so when we did some experiments looking at uh, what happens when you bubble with nitrogen gas and looking at the dissolved oxygen, the pH, this is the sort of relationship we get. And so to create the way, again, the way it's been done for 50 years to create hypoxic conditions, the way everyone always done it, just bubble with nitrogen, you actually create basic conditions. So, and just for reference, here's the Forge River in the summer, whereby when you get down to low pH, it's also low DO and vice versa, right? Because I, as I explained earlier on, this is all being driven by respiration. And so what that means is we've got about five or six decades of data about hypoxia that has nothing to do with what you actually see uh, in an environmental setting. Uh, and in fact, um, you can't find anywhere because that's not how CO2 makes it into these coastal systems uh, under hypoxia. And so very simply, I just took Bob Allen's recommendations and said, well, why don't we add some CO2 back into the system? Uh, and in doing that, we were able to set up experiments that in some cases, so, you know, surprisingly enough, I mean, here we are, you know, it was 2010, whatever year it was, uh, for the first time to look at, for some organisms, uh, isolated hypoxia uh, with 
normal levels of pH. Um, and then finally, hypoxia and acidic conditions together. And of course, we already knew about the acidification. And so to quickly roll through some of what we found in doing so, uh, firstly, for example, finding that hypoxia alone leads to uh, smaller individuals, these are with regards to base gallop larvae, and that they actually had a smaller effect in the survival, and it was actually the acidification that led to reductions in survival for the scallop larvae. So the bottom line is, in an ecosystem setting, the larvae are being exposed to both hypoxia and acidification, um, and that without looking at both of these things together, you're missing the full picture. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to pass through these where we kind of reverse engineered the same effect and moved to this experiment where we started working with juvenile clams a little bit older uh, and more resistant to hypoxia and acidification. Uh, and here we found that while they had no, they were not affected, the growth rates of these small clams not affected by low oxygen or low pH, but when they got both conditions together, you slowed down their growth rate. So a physiological effect only manifested once you're looking at both conditions together. And so this is a true synergistic effect, uh, and one that's been predicted in the literature uh, by uh, physiologists who understand that when you overstress the organism, uh, they may be able to hand one of those, handle one of those stressors, but not necessarily both. Uh, and then on the fish front, uh, did similar experiments to what we showed before just for CO2. And so again, this is Menidia barilina, which I already showed you is sensitive to CO2, sensitive to low oxygen, and then this additive effect, whereby if you had 75% of survival of the larvae when they're exposed to ideal conditions, very few surviving when they're hitting, hit with both stressors uh, through the larval stage. And then for wild-caught Menidia menidia, interestingly, no effect of acidification alone. Uh, a minor effect from DO, but a very clear effect like with the juvenile hard clams when they're hit with both stressors concurrently. Uh, and then to under, better understand how these diurnal patterns uh, of DO and pH may affect larvae, we began to conduct experiments to better understand what are the implications there. Because one of the implications could be that, well, maybe during the day when they get the really good conditions, the high pH and the high DO, they can compensate for the period of time uh, when they're exposed to hypoxia and acidification. So we set up a system, very, very complex, very complex system with sprinkler timers and solenoid valves, uh, and connected to what we normally use, our gas proportionators, uh, to again set up similar kinds of conditions that I've explained to you before, uh, but also to vary them on a diurnal basis. So again, this is the experimental system we generated whereby we were able to have, at, during the day, high pH and, um, and high DO and lower conditions at night. Uh, these were recently published in the last uh, year or so. So to go through some of these experiments, uh, seven different treatments then, a control, and then conditions whereby, with regards to pH, it's either uh, DO is normal and the pH is fluctuating on a day-night cycle. Uh, or the DO is normal, the pH, the, excuse me, the pH is normal, the DO is fluctuating day night, uh, and both going day night, and then also the organism is being chronically exposed to the conditions as well. So be able to compare chronic and diurnal exposure, and to walk through some of what we found. This is with base scallop larvae. Um, here, you can see the pH being significantly higher in the diurnal exposure, but the survival being no different than the low pH condition, right? Because this, this condition here is fluctuating. It's hitting 7.2 at night. It's hitting 7.9 by day. On average, it's 7.5. Uh, but the outcome for the larvae looks like they're hitting it all the time. Dissolved oxygen was actually even more dramatic in that um, the outcome, even though the, on average the oxygen levels are higher, their performance was worse than if they had chronically uh, low levels of DO. And again, a similar story here. No real difference, uh, even though that they're hitting the high levels of DO and pH by day. If they're hitting the other levels at night, they look, the outcome for survival was almost the same. A second iteration of this experiment was one whereby we had perfect conditions. We had acidic and hypoxic conditions. We had one that hit exactly the middle, 
so a mean condition, uh, and then one that was fluctuating between the high and the low, like I talked about before. And so here's an outcome for that kind of experiment. Uh, what we see is that even though, just get to here, the one that's fluctuating up and down and has the same, same pH and same DO as the chronic is actually doing worse in this particular case. Uh, this is for scallop larvae. Uh, and similarly, or somewhat similarly for, for larval clams, we see that in the reduced condition, which has the same pH as the, and same DO as the one that's fluctuating up and down between the high condition and the low condition, the outcome is actually slightly worse and certainly no better. Um, so, you know, what might be going on here? Certainly, uh, we know that bivalves and other invertebrates can fluctuate between aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. Uh, and so, essentially, by being exposed to these diurnal conditions, they're needing to switch on and off between these two different metabolisms. Uh, and it might be at a time course that they cannot adapt to. Uh, and then, luckily, just a few months ago, this paper came out showing that the fluctuating pH and pCO2 conditions, like predicted for the hypoxia, also is more energetically expensive than having chronic levels. Uh, so needing to adapt makes it more difficult. Uh, and so certainly we can say that the diurnal change in DO and pH don't make things better, and they may even worsen things uh, for early life stage bivalves. And I'm going to jump to the very last section so we have some time for questions. Um, and so the very last section here uh, is a little bit of a term, but I'm going to come back to bivalves in the end. Uh, this paper was published, you can see, in 2013, and it was about what might be the effects of acidification for submerged aquatic vegetation. And they specifically broke it up between seagrasses and macroalgae. And the take-home message from that review paper is we know a lot about seagrasses. They're definitely going to benefit from high CO2, but we really don't know much about macroalgae. And at about the same time, Ryan was finishing up his master's degree where he looked at things controlling the growth of ulva in Jamaica Bay. And so, you know, the macroalgae, seaweeds are supposed to be promoted by nutrients. But in this system, they, you can give them all the nutrients, they have all the nutrients they need, right? You can give them tons more, no effect whatsoever. But it did, we also knew about the high levels of CO2 there, and it got us to think, you know, what might be the ramifications for high CO2 for this macrophyte. And so here's Craig Young with his Iron Maiden shirt. I don't know how many people know Craig Young, big heavy metal fan, uh, but also a really smart guy who's done some very interesting experiments with macroalgae, so, and specifically looking at the effects of acidification. And so in this particular paper, he looked specifically at two macroalgae, Gracilaria, uh, whereby he saw that, uh, firstly, that his experimental conditions for growth under control were even better than in situ. So we had worry, we able to prove that our experimental growth matches what's happening or exceeds what's happening in the field, that nutrients didn't have a big effect, but certainly a very large effect from CO2 and also from nutrients. And with ulva, somewhat of an additive effect, a little bit of an effect from nutrients, uh, certainly an effect from CO2 and an additive effect between the two. This is sort of a summation of multiple experiments. Um, he then went on to look at competition between these different macroalgae and phytoplankton. Uh, people familiar with Ivan Vaiella's work in estuaries has sort of set up this gradient whereby as estuaries get more enriched in nutrients, they move away from seagrasses uh, and then maybe even away from macroalgae, which would be on the bottom of the estuary, and then get shaded out and dominated by phytoplankton. So Craig wanted to look at this, but specifically now considering what if you add in CO2? And so we ran experiments with and without competition, uh, that is, without direct exposure of these different organisms, and found essentially that, you know, for, actually I should say, the seagrass part was theoretical. This experiment didn't look at seagrass, uh, but he did see how uh, uh, different phytoplankton would do without the competition from the macroalgae. But when you added in competition, you began to see more separation, and specifically that the macroalgae would begin to, under high CO2, would outgrow some of the phytoplankton. Um, he also has considered how the macroalgae might compete with seagrass. Remember, I told you that review paper talked about how high CO2 benefits seagrass. But now we have the evidence that the high CO2 is also benefiting the macroalgae. How do they compete together? Uh, and so 
this is some results from there. This is a collaboration with Brad Peterson, our seagrass wizard uh, on the Southampton campus. And so indeed, as we expected, the CO2 uh, enhanced the growth of the seagrass, but the co-presence of ulva consistently would depress that same productivity. Um, so some degree of competition, particularly under high CO2. And then the very last result I want to show, this is brand new, uh, but for me, very, I guess because it's new, exciting, and that's why I wanted to get to it. Uh, and that is, what are the implications for the high CO2 and the overgrowth of ulva for bivalves? Now, we put these experiments together last summer because what I thought my, the hypothesis was, there's some evidence out there showing that ulva has negative uh, effects, can be um, toxic specifically to different invertebrates and specifically early life stages of bivalves. And so we went out under the assumption that if we hit the bivalves with both the ulva that's growing great because of the high CO2 and the high CO2, the bivalves are going to totally tank. And of course, we were very, the reason it's exciting is because we were totally wrong. Uh, and what we found is that, and this is consistent, I'm just showing you one graph here, but we've got seven experiments with four, all four of these species in multiple cohorts every outcome was the same. And that is, the bivalves' growth rate of juvenile oysters, about five millimeters in size, um, slight, in this case, a slight boost in the growth, not significant, but in the presence of ulva, a significant depression when you hit them with CO2, uh, acidification effect that we've been talking about this entire presentation. But in every case, adding in the ulva actually would rescue the bivalves from the high CO2. And so we looked at the chemistry to find that the ulva had a mitigating effect on the saturation state of aragonite. And specifically, in this case, we're bringing it from undersaturated to saturated. Uh, and so this could have implications uh, for aquaculture and specifically the co-growth of macroalgae and bivalves. All right, so with that, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, let's see what I have to say here to wrap up. Uh, Hypoxia and acidification occurs during the seasons, I didn't emphasize this, when early life stage fish and shellfish are actually in the water. So it's an unfortunate co-occurrence. Uh, that is, you know, if this was happening at different times of the year for both, it wouldn't matter, but actually the acidification and hypoxia occurs when these early life stages are spawned. Um, and that the levels of hypoxia and acidification can have negative outcomes for the survival of both fish and bivalves. Uh, and that the diurnal exposure can make things a little bit worse, in fact. Um, and I won't talk too much about this, but I think this has important policy implications. Recognize that the policy on oxygen, uh, what policy, there's no policy, federal policy or state policy on pH, really. Uh, it's out there, but if you look at the language, it, it it's totally doesn't apply. Um, and so all the policies are built around oxygen and experiments that were done with nitrogen gas assuming that, okay, here's what happens when they hit just low oxygen. But the fact of the matter is, we now know that those hypoxic conditions are also acidified, and our policies are not considering that. And I think that has important uh, implications. Uh, and then lastly, the exciting results with regard to seaweed and how they may grow to the detriment of seagrasses but could benefit bivalves. So I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions. And Um, well, I, I have a two-fold take on it. Uh, the first one would be that certainly over time, there's going to be adaptation. And so we're actually doing a little research into that. Actually, Boss was doing research on that as well. Uh, and so I think that 
you know, you're absolutely right. Our transgenerational experiments, we're only considering one generation. But maybe over time, the populations are adapting in certain locations and doing better. Um, we think we might have some evidence for that in a particular eutrophic location, but we need to look into it further. But the other thing I'd say is I think, actually, these ecosystems are, are already, what we're looking at is the consequence of, in some cases, of what's left. That is to say, uh, if you look at the distribution of, for example, scallops, right? You can, you can go and find that they used to be here, and now they're not there anymore. Uh, and so you know, I think the more sensitive organisms, one of the experiments I skipped, in fact, um, was one where we took water from the Forge River, and we tried to rear bay scallops in it. And um, did I show that experiment? Oh, I did show that experiment. I, mean, I talked about it so fast, I don't even remember. <laughs> But we could, okay, but we could rescue, the, the scallops just perished in that water. However, if we buffered that water with carbonate, we could, we could bring them back and they would actually survive. And so, and so what I'd say is that, again, the t twofold answer is one, I'm sure there are organisms that, are, or, that have adapted and that certainly they've, been, they've selected for the lines that are gonna be able to resist hypoxia and acidification. But I think also, in addition, there's been lines and organisms that have been selected out and are no longer there. You know, you can find the places, uh, specifically on Long Island, um, Jamaica Bay, where the organisms used to be there and they're not there anymore. So I think uh, that's, that's the twofold answer uh, to your question. Nick. So with increasing uh, acidification, particularly in bottom waters, uh, where there's eutrophication as well, so uh, lower oxygen, uh, lower pH. I'm wondering what might happen to uh, metals and other substances down to the sediments, particularly in a place like Jamaica Bay, which is loaded with contaminants. And so you might expect to see greater desorption under those conditions of metals from sediment into the overlying water, which could increase bioaccumulation of metals in whatever organisms are, are there. Has anyone been looking at that? Not really. Uh, it's funny you mention it because actually probably the last set of cruises I did with Sergio before he left, we had a data set, it's still out there, but essentially showing that during the summer when that pH is low, the metal levels are going up. Uh, and the bioavailable, we, you know, he, he had ways of uh, separating out the total dissolved from the bio, the lay bile bioavailable metals. And those levels were definitely, it was very clear, multiple metals, just as you had predicted, were higher. Um, that manuscript is sort of one of those ones that's sort of just lingering in the ether right now um, and waiting for someone to pluck it down and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But yeah, and I, and I do think that that is um, an important consideration, right? Because now we, you know, what this is saying, I mean, we, the metal levels are going to change the function of many things. But certainly, yeah, when you hit this level of hypoxia and acidification, um, it's going to lead to, you know, for many metals, not all, but many right. uh, disorders. Including some which are going to be toxic. Like Absolutely. Copper, copper, for example, would be one that I would look at. Yeah. But many. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And not just Jamaica Bay, but where yeah. this occurs. Yep. Mary. So um, to me, it seems like you, know, you showed how high the PCO2 and so on Presumably, they they were always high. The Chesapeake Bay has always had high it, 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 So some of it's anthropogenic nutrient input, and some of it's just because of circulation. Has anybody gone back and tried? I mean, based on the kinds of suppressors you're putting on there, I mean, has anybody tried to go back and calculate what the pH was pre 100 years ago, or in, at the times when oysters were flourishing in the, in the Hudson and whatever? Not that I'm because aware I, because of. Because I think that would be an interesting thing. I mean, maybe if you look at your experiments, it may be these always have been seen. Kind of yeah, not, uh, not that I'm aware of. Although, you, you do make me think of the fact that I think I, I didn't zoom in on it. But, you know, one area, the East River has discharged from 44 sewage treatment right. plants. Yeah. And the water flows like crazy. And you can almost never find the pH being above 7.3. I mean, it's really acidified. Um, 
And I think we could all agree that wasn't the case when the settlers came and the oyster reefs were lining Manhattan. So some areas I fully agree have always been uh, anoxic basins. Like Yep. So the question is, is there any feeling for like how big the cumulative change is? Yeah, some people have looked. Yep. Some people have looked at that. So I just think about Wee Jung Kai. He's at the University of Delaware now, and um, where they look at acidification in, for example, the Gulf of Mexico during the hypoxic zone uh, occurrences there, and they can attribute about two thirds to organic loading, but then there's also the third from the atmosphere. And so that's the thing, you know, the atmosphere is already uh, having an effect. But I, you know. But these pHs of 7.2 aren't coming from the atmosphere. It has nothing to do with the atmosphere. The CO2 Correct. The atmosphere is far, as you said, it's far too low yeah. to push the pH that low. So really it's all coming from the CO2 the So the, the real question I'm asking is, you know, could you attribute ocean, uh, acidification of Long Island Sound? Could you give like a percentage and a, you know, atmospheric CO2 percentage and a natural, I think that would be, that would be cool. In, ter in, terms yeah. of, in terms of deciding how much of it is our problem, right. how much is natural, yeah. because if it's natural, these organisms have had centuries to evolve into populations that have survived, and, and not all the disappearance is due to acidification, some of it's over Certainly. Or yeah. And recognize, you know, the areas that we're talking about, at least the, the areas that historically are natural are you're really basins in the middle bottom of Long Island Sound, as opposed to the, you know, the today where it's a little bit more widespread in the coastal zones and harbors and such. Well, I know, but, every, but I'm, I'm just arguing, yeah, trying I, to encourage people to remember that yeah. you can want it to be anthropogenic because that's what will get funded, <laughs> right. but you should at least test that hypothesis. Yeah. No, I ag agree, that, and I, I like your idea of looking at the three different components. In fact, I don't think I don't think anyone's done that. People have looked at the extent to how much is natural versus how much is atmospheric, but uh, and natural being, I'm sorry, they've looked at how much is eutrophic versus or organic matter versus atmospheric, but people haven't really looked at uh, how much of it would be just residual from circulation patterns. So like Dick Feely and Wee Jin Kai have broken out the those two components but not including the third. Yeah, agree. I think we have time for one more question. Or for pizza. pizza. You have well I, I'm hoping there's pizza because sometimes when you you're one of us the pizza doesn't come. Oh really? So, <laughs> That's why I gave this talk. Come on. <laughs> Um, well, I think baseline data is important. You know, there's like, we've, we've collected a bunch of data, but I think, uh, you know, there's definitely more data that needs to be collected with, to better understand the dynamics, uh, response from the atmosphere. And, um, you know, and it, it, then it depends what the focus is. The focus is aquaculture, uh, you know, there, and mitigation. There's lots of things that can be done on that front, working with hatcheries. You know, we've done experiments where we can show that in a hatchery that experiences acidification, you can rescue the larvae by buffering the water they use. I gave some evidence of, you know, co-culturing as a means for, for helping. So I, I think it depends what the, you know, what the priorities are. Uh, but it, uh, regardless, I think having better monitoring data is, uh, would be first order priority in my mind. 